I'm Alexandra Levy with the Atomic Heritage Foundation. We're here on September 13th, 2018 in Chantilly, Virginia with Robert Krauss. My first question is to please say your name and to spell it. Robert Krauss, R-O-B-E-R-T-K-R-A-U-S-S. -S. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about your life and career and your and your involvement in the 509th Composite Group. Sure. I was born in the Bronx in 1943. In 1961, I left to go to college in Illinois. Uh, my career, I was following a career in biology. I actually wanted to be a, a forester. And uh, that kind of just fell through. I just I needed to work when I was in college, so I, I got a job. And I was working for most of my life in manufacturing. I worked as a materials manager, a purchasing agent, a supervisor, all again in heavy industry, uh, iron castings, steel fabrication, that sort of thing. Uh, it, one of my jobs, it, they, they've always been high pressure jobs, and one of my jobs was 50 miles from home. So what I would do during the lunch hour, I would go to the library and I was reading books on World War II, and I was fascinated by the book Enola Gay by um, Morgan and Witt. And I just wanted to do more research. There was some questions in the book as to how many planes were used on the mission and so on. And I just thought, well, these fellows are still alive. And I had done some family research on World War II history of my own family and my wife's family. And I thought, gee, I'm going to see if I could find these fellows and just try to learn more about what they did. And this was the middle 1980s. And back at that time, the men were getting hate mail and hate phone calls at the anniversary of the bombing. So I found out that it wasn't really very easy to find the men. Uh, but if you had the confidence of one man, he would then pass you on to the next person. The first person I found was George Caron. George was the tail gunner on the Enola Gay, and he was he was somewhat public. You could find him because he was a member the, at that time of the Confederate Air Force. Then he was going to air shows with Fifi, the B-29, uh, during the summer months. So I found George, and George was kind enough to pass me on to Ray Gallagher. And Ray Gallagher was the assistant flight engineer on what was later called the Great Artiste, and then also on the boxcar for the August 9th mission. So Ray really befriended me. He and I became very close friends. And between the two of them, I, I slowly but surely got to know members of both crews. In 1990, I investigated going to the reunion in Wendover. And it was at that point that I met many of the men in the 509th. And we started in 1990 going to the reunions. Uh, we've been to every reunion. Uh, of the 509th since 1990. In 2000, in the year 2000, a vote was held uh, as to whether they wanted another reunion. And nobody would step forward. Well, I need to go backwards here a second. I had a historical display at that reunion. I was showing my collection. And we met a gentleman by the name of James Peterson, who is now the president of historic Wendover Airfield. Well, Jim was talking to me all weekend, all during this, the, the, re, uh, the reunion. And we sort of came up with an idea between the two of us. We became fast friends, and we had the common interests in the 509th. So we sort of cooked up an idea that maybe we could do a reunion. So when the vote was held, and nobody would step forward against my wife's wishes. I raised my hand and said, if you'll go to Wendover one more time, we'll do the reunion. And I didn't say anything about Jim at that point, but Jim was very instrumental in that reunion. Uh, he got the airfield involved. Uh, we had some, a great celebration out there. And uh, the people enjoyed it so much that they asked my wife and I to run the next reunion. So this became 17 reunions later. <laughs> That's what we did. So we ran 17 reunions. Uh, and we had a great time doing that. So what is your official title as part of the 509th? 
Well, originally it was just reunion chairmen, but last year uh, the remaining veterans uh, did bestow the honor upon me of, a, of, of official historian. So when did these reunions start and how many people, veterans, typically participated over the years? To my knowledge, uh, I would say the first reunion was probably in the 1960s, early 1960s. More than likely it was organized by Jacob Beeser. And then they held the reunion every, I believe it was every two years after that. When my wife Amelia and I started doing the reunions, we did it on a yearly basis. When we did the 2001 reunion, we thought it was going to be the last reunion of the 509th. So what we did was, and I'm not really, I don't remember who all the speakers were prior to us taking over. They usually had a speaker every year, but we decided to really bowl them over with, if this was the last reunion, we're going to do a, a really good job on it. So my wife and I came up with a commemorative booklet for them. It was an eight and a half by uh, 11 uh, brochure with pictures of their experiences and, and pictures of the crews at Wendover and stories of their experiences. Uh, we brought in D.D. Uh, Mormon and Dora Doherty. They were the two wasps that Paul Tibbetts trained to fly a B-29 called Lady Bird. Uh, he did that when he was part of the B-29 testing program because many of the men were afraid to fly the B-29 because of the engine fires. So a lot of men didn't want to fly it. So Paul came up with this idea that if a woman could fly it, a man could fly it. So they, they started on this tour through the Southwest and it was ended rather quickly, but he got the point across. So we had E.D. and Dora there. Then we had two survivors of the USS Indianapolis. And then we had Hap Halloran there who was in a different bomb group, but he had been shot down in Japan and he was put on display in the zoo in Tokyo naked. And he was you know, badly mistreated by the Japanese. So that was our first reunion. And ever since then, we always had a very good keynote speaker. And how many veterans of the 509th Composite Group are still alive today? Well, my wife and I do the newsletters. Uh, we try to do at least six newsletters a year. Uh, when we started doing the newsletters, we incorporated at least two to three pages of history of the 509th that maybe they hadn't seen or heard about before. Right now, the mailing list, uh, we show approximately 20 veterans left out of, I believe it was 1,770 men in the unit, approximately. So there's only 20 left. And um, who are still alive who, were, who flew on the Enola Gay or the boxcar on the strike planes on the target missions? There are no survivors from either of those atomic missions. Now, Russell Gackenbach is alive, and he flew the Enola Gay on the second mission as the Kokura Advanced Weather B-29. And so he's the last one to have seen a cloud in the air. He is the because only Because he, he also flew, excuse me, he flew on... Uh, ship number 91, which was known as necessary, later named Necessary Evil, and he flew on that ship during the Hiroshima mission. So Mr. Gackenbach is the only one alive who saw right. the five, who saw the mushroom cloud Correct. on either mission. He and Carl Ackerman, who was a pilot also, uh, they're the last two uh, crew members alive of any of the planes. Of any of the planes. Correct. Ackerman was... Uh, that's what I want to call a substitute crew member. He was used when they needed him. So you've done a terrific job collecting documents and artifacts relating to the 509th. Um, what got you interested in collecting those items, and can you talk about some of the kind of gems of your collection? Sure. Uh, my mother-in-law, her husband was a, a uh, flight surgeon in the Army Air Force, and she used to get a magazine called Retired Officer. And on the back page all, all the time was a, an ad for something. I can't remember exactly what it was. But there was always a, a crew picture, and the crew picture was autographed, and it was a World War II flight crew. And I thought to myself, it would be kind of neat. You know, everybody's heard about the Enola Gay and the boxcar, but nobody really knows anything about the other planes. Certainly I didn't. So I just took it upon myself. I started collecting pictures of the Enola Gay 
and the boxcar and having them autographed. But I thought, what a great idea to come up with pictures of the other crew members from the other planes and also pictures of the other planes. So I felt that I was, uh, that I was fighting time because men were passing away while I was doing this. And so I just kind of really made it a, a mission to just chase down these pictures and, and get them autographed. And I came up with a rather large collection of both autographed and unautographed pictures, numbering in the thousands. I spent quite a bit of my own money. Uh, what we would do is I would borrow the original picture. There was a professional photo lab within two or three blocks from where I worked at the time. I would take the original picture to the photo lab. He would make a copy of the picture with a copy camera, creating a negative, and then he would chemically reproduce an 8x10 picture for me. What I would then do is share with the men copies of these pictures. In return, my payment was autograph a picture for me. And that's how I accumulated the, the collection that I've got. Now, at some point, you have all the pictures you can get of the plane, so I started going off into other tangents like scenery or their living quarters, and I was trading those pictures for more autographs. So this is how I came up with such a large collection. But one thing I wanted to say was that the men were really cooperative. Just the other day, I was looking through a file, and I found a letter from Len Godfrey, who was the uh, navigator on the Fred Bach crew. And in 1993, Len said, I'd be more than happy to work with you because I think someday you're going to be our official historian. And that floored me because I totally had forgotten about that letter. And uh, that, that, I look at that as quite a compliment. But the men were very cooperative in, in working with me. And if I may, I just spoke about Len Godfrey, but I wanted to bring up Fred Bach. Fred Bach, of course, the plane, uh, Number 77 was named after him. Uh, it was called Box Car, which is spelled one word. Uh, Fred had a summer home about 30 miles from where we live. And Fred was one of the first people I met. And this was in the 1980s. And again, when everything was sort of secret, I would, he would have in his hands when we talk a copy of the roster. And he would never let me borrow the roster. He might give me a name and a phone number to contact a person if they were willing to talk, but I could never put my hands on the roster. But what I would do with Fred is every year, I would, when I came up with new pictures, whether they were pictures of their living compound or the pictures of the planes, I would visit Fred. And we would spend a half an hour, or it was half an hour, half a day at uh, Warren up in the dunes in Michigan. And he had a summer home overlooking the lake. And his wife would sit there, she would be reading, and uh, Fred would take out a magnifying glass. He'd be checking out serial numbers on the planes and so on. But what Fred instilled in me uh, really was the fact that the, the planes did not fly with their nose art. And they were just basically, they had two sets of numbers. They were numbered 1 through 13 when they first arrived on Tinian. And then when it was thought that Tokyo Rose knew of their existence, they camouflaged the planes by changing the numbers on it. So they went from, for example, boxcar, if you look at the numbers on an original photo, you'll see that the two sevens are not matching. The original number for boxcar was seven, and then it was changed to 777. They called it a victor number, and that's how they referred to it. But uh, Fred always uh, just instilled on me that the the fat man bomb symbols that you see on the plane are the missions that the crew flew, not the plane. And when you think of the fact that these planes had no nose art, the only people that really knew what plane they were getting into was basically the flight engineer or anybody who had something to do with it, writing a serial number, which was on the tail of the plane, into their logbook. Because again, uh, there, is, there has been a question as to whether the Hiroshima Advance B-29, which was called Straight Flush, that was the Claude Etherly crew, they may have flown with the nose art. Um, part of the crew said they did, the other part said they didn't. But it depicts a picture of a, a Japanese soldier going into a toilet. 
So what I was told by Jack Bivens, the assistant flight engineer, was that Paul Tibbetts told them that they really shouldn't have it on the plane because if they were shot down, the Japanese people would be offended and who knows what would have happened to them. What about the names of the planes? Were those given before or after the missions for the most the part? The names of the planes were given after the mission. I would say that the, the nose art for the planes were, uh, it was probably done after the bombs were dropped. The men had probably a lot of time on their hands. So with, they, did, they did fly training missions still, but I think it was at that point when they started doing painting of the nose art. Uh, I've never really been able to find out who painted the nose art on the planes. There is a picture of the 509th uh, album of one of the fellows by the name of Porter Richard, Richardson, who is a uh, flight line crew, he was a radar countermeasure crew chief, and he was a nose art painter. And you can see him sitting on the scaffolding painting the nose art on boxcar. But who painted the others, I don't know. I was told that the crew members traded alcohol in return for the nose art being painted on the planes. Now, how they came up with the names, uh, I can tell you that uh, the Big Stink was named that. I was told by one of the crew members that they called it that because they had so many trouble, how many, so many trouble with the plane that, uh, when they flew it. So they just named it that way. Straight Flush was named after uh, uh, Claude Etherly, Chris, uh, Etherly and his co-pilot uh, Weatherly liked to play cards. So they would, when they were flying a mission, one of their conventional bombing missions, they would set it on autopilot and they'd be playing poker inside the plane. What about the Great Artiste? The Great Artiste was named after Kermit Behand. And uh, that's where you, when you look at the nose art, it's an, it's an image of Kermit Behand with a what looks like a period zoot suit uh, at the time, and that's what they call them. And he's got his thumb up in the air, which is typically what a bombardier would do. And they just called him the great artiste because that referred to his proficiency with the ladies, shall we say. And again, that was named after the war was over. What, can you tell the story about how the Anole Gay got its name in Noah's art? Well, uh, to my knowledge, uh, Paul Tibbetts did not want a picture of a naked lady or anything like that on the plane. He knew, they basically knew their crew, and, or he knew that the crew would be famous and what they were doing would be known for many, many years. So he just decided to name it after his mother, Enola Gay Haggard. And it was done uh, uh, just before the mission uh, on the same day and it was just I was told it was done by a CB or maybe somebody within the unit I'm not really sure on that was there any um, consternation among any of the other crew about the name or t Tibbetts be being the one to select it the when Paul was part of the B-29 training program in Eglin Field, I want to say he met at least about 50 men there. Uh, he met George Caron there, who was the tail gunner in the Enola Gay. He met Ray Gallagher there, uh, who was the assistant flight engineer on the Great Artiste. He met Don Albury there, who was the uh, pilot, or actually the airplane commander of the Great Artiste. He met Charles Sweeney there. And of course, he met Bob Lewis there. Bob Lewis was the airplane commander of Victor 82, which was the number of the Enola Gay. And I, I did not know Bob Lewis, so I don't want to say this with authenticity, but there are many books out there that state that Lewis was upset that that name was painted on the plane. And you can read about that, but again, I didn't speak to Lewis and I didn't speak to Paul about that. Um, can you talk about how the crews were all um, assorted to different planes and how that's caused some confusion about who might have actually flown on 
which plane at, on certain missions? That's a tough question. Uh, they were they were basic. They were assigned their planes at Wendover. Uh, they were originally there was two sets of B-29s. They had a a set of planes that were modified by the 216th Base Unit. They took older B-29s and they took the excuse me they took the turrets off and they put just plates over them or whatever. And then they were uh, Paul used the code word silver plate and ordered new B-29s for them. They were specially modified. They had no top turrets. They had no side turrets. They had the uh, fast-acting bomb bay doors, and their propellers were reversible. But these crews were all assigned to a, a, a plane at that point. They did have more pilots they could, than they could use. So those crews were put into the 320th, which were five C-54 transport planes. If they still had extra pilots, they were then sent on to other units. So at Tinian, when they were selecting the crews for the missions, in some cases, some of the crews ended up on planes that they were not regularly assigned to. Well, that happened basically, it was predetermined. When I told you about the people at uh, Eglin Field, these all became, they were, Paul knew who they were. He, they were, uh, you know, all good friends. Paul knew that they were well trained. He knew that they knew the B, knew how to operate the B-29s. So when they st when he started up the project at Wendover, he called up Tom Farabee, his former bombardier, and he called up uh, Theodore Dutch Van Kirk, his former navigator, and they basically, uh, when the when the bombing came about for August sixth, the original bombardier and the original navigator were removed from the plane, and Dutch and Tom were put in their place. The justification to that for me was that these fellows flew 50 plus missions over North Africa. Paul knew them. Uh, he knew how they would operate. He knew they were good. Uh, even though the 393rd Bomb Group was a well-trained unit, Paul knew that he could depend on these two men. Unfortunately, uh, the two fellows that were removed from the plane became very bitter over that. Uh, they did fly conventional bombing missions with, with pumpkin bombs, but uh, you know they just didn't make it to that mission. But as far as when, when you look at who made up the crews, many of these people came from Eglin Field. For example, Don Albury was an airplane commander, but he was a second lieutenant. Most of the plane commanders in the 509th or 393rd were majors or captains. But again, uh, when you look at that great artiste crew or the boxcar crew, you'll see that everybody in there came from Eglin Field, as I recall that. So. Uh, when Charles Sweeney, Charles Sweeney was the 393rd Squadron Commander. When he flew with the crew, he flew with the Albury crew. And what that would do is that would put Don Albury, who was the airplane commander, into the co-pilot seat. And then Sweeney would fly the plane. Don Albury had a co-pilot by the name of uh, Fred, Al Fred, excuse me, Fred Olivi and Fred would then be off the plane. Fred made this, the atomic bomb mission because he had asked Don Albury if he could go on the mission. Don then went to Charles Sweeney. Charles Sweeney said, why not? So that's how there were 13 men on board the boxcar when the Enola Gay had 12. Paul t told people that if he had known Fred Olivi was there, he would have stopped it. But. I knew Fred. Fred was a very good spokesperson for the 509th. He, he did very well on justification of the bomb. I have found, I have paperwork belonging to a fellow by the name of Vernon Beebe, who was a staff flight engineer. He ended up on the Great Artiste for the second mission. And there's no records that he's on that mission. Yet I have his documents. I have his original documentation, the original flight orders for that mission. I have his combat records for that mission. 
I have his calculations showing the weight of the bomb versus the weight of the plane. Yet, the last fellow alive, by the time I received this paperwork, the last fellow alive was the radar operator, Bill Barney. I asked Bill, I said, do you remember Vernon Beebe on the plane? He says, no. But everything shows he was there. And Beebe did say he was on it. So there was a lot of that sort of thing. Unfortunately, within the records of the 393rd, they're not, you, you can look at the mission orders for, I have something like 50 mission orders, and they're not really complete. They don't show who was on all the planes. The uh, Fred Krug was the 393rd weatherman, and Fred Krug wanted to fly a mission over Japan. So the guys in uh, Straight Flush took Fred Krug on a mission over Japan. Yet there's no record that he was ever, ever flew that mission. He didn't get credit for it. But that sort of thing happened all the time. I know one thing you wanted to talk about um, are, was people who, or relatives who may claim now that their family member was involved in the atomic bombing missions or were part of the 509th. Sure. Well, we did a book called The 509th Remembered, and we did 14 years of book signings with Dutch Van Kirk. And one of the things I wanted to do was to make sure that we had a very accurate roster in the back of our book. Now, Dick Campbell, a historian who's now deceased, and Fred Bach uh, coordinated their notes, and they came up with a complete roster. And so we used that, we double-checked that roster. We found that one man was listed twice, and we found that there was one man that was not listed. But we made sure that was in the book. And one of the problems we encountered when we did tours with, with Dutch Van Kirk, and we did tours all over the country, we, from as far south as Florida to west as Texas, north into Massachusetts, it seemed like whenever we did a signing, there was always somebody who came up and said, well, my father loaded the bomb, or my, my grandfather was on such and such plane. Well, it, it, it becomes a point, we, we would look up in the roster, and they weren't there. And this became very frustrating because you have a hard time telling this person, saying, you know, they were not there, yet somebody in their family said they were. And, you're, and you, you're in a situation where you're almost calling them a liar. It got to the point it happened so much towards the end, we just said, oh, that's interesting. But the roster in the Campbell book and the Krauss book is accurate. If they're not in that roster, they just weren't there. They were not on Tinian. Now, when the 509th came back to the States and the men had enough points to get out, which was approximately November and December of 1945, the Army Air Corps needed to fill that unit back up again. So there were men brought in from other units, and they did become part of the 509th Composite Group. The Composite Group, to my knowledge, was disbanded in 1946 in April, and they then became 58th Bomb Wing 509th. But the word composite group at that point was dropped. Um, for people who, who don't know, can you explain what the, you mentioned the 393rd and the 320th, what, how, what were all those in relation to the 509th? Well, these were individual units that comprised the 509th. You had the 603rd Air Engineering, uh, you had the 1st Ordnance Special Aviation, the 393rd Bomb Group was the nucleus, they were the planes. The 320th was the transport division. And each one of these units had their own specialties. Uh, the 603rd Air Engineering, these were people that would have been mechanics. Uh, they would be fixing plane parts or uh, fixing gauges that were in the plane. Uh, the 1st Ordnance Special Avi Aviation, these were the fellows that would load the tail gun, tail gun uh, on the plane. Uh, they would work on the, the, ca the machine gun. Uh, they would load the bombs uh, because the 509th did practice with 500-pound bombs. They also went out on pumpkin missions with 10,000-pound bombs loaded with Torpex. And that's when, when you look at the nose art on the planes, again, you'll see a black fat man. That, that fat man was for each mission the crew flew. And then if they participated in an atomic mission, they would get a red fat man. That fat man sort of looks like, if you haven't seen it, it sort of looks like uh, Alfred Hitchcock from the side view. 
So the combat missions were using the pumpkin bombs. Those were done over Japan. Were they yes. met as practice for the atomic bomb missions? That's correct, right. Uh, originally, the 509th was, was training. And the reason they had all these crews, they were going to drop atomic bombs on Germany. The only trouble was that they couldn't develop the atomic bomb before Germany surrendered. So that they basically, the fact that Germany surrendered in May and the atomic bomb was uh, tested at the Trinity site in July, that, that basically saved Germany. But these, these men were highly trained in the 393rd. Again, that was the nucleus, all the crews, and those crews were assigned at Wendover. They were trained by a fellow by the name of Tom Classen. Tom Classen is an unsung hero in the 509th. Uh, not a lot of people know him or recognize his name, but Tom received the Distinguished Service Cross before Paul got his. Paul got the, dis the Distinguished Service Cross for the Hiroshima mission. Tom Classen got his over Bougainville. He actually was in a, uh, a firefight with B-17, uh, in his B-17 with Japanese fighters. His plane actually, he landed in the water and his crew survived for many, many days in the water. I, I'm not looking at the reference on this, so I can't say how long it was, but it was at least several weeks. And they finally ended up on an island in the Solomons. And uh, they were eventually rescued. Uh, they, some of the crew took, I think Tom and several others took off in a boat, and they ended up uh, finding an air base and getting the men off the island. But that's how Tom received his. But he, he really trained these men quite well. And they all, they're all young. They're all in their 20s. You know, they're flying a million dollar airplane. And they all felt that they could drop an atomic bomb, possibly even better than some of the other crews. But of course, most of them didn't know that they were, until, until after the atomic bomb missions, what it was that they would be dropping besides well, Tibbets. Is that correct? Of, some of them. They were told they couldn't talk. And there is truism that if they, if they did talk, they were sent to Alaska somewhere. Uh, and that, did, that actually did happen. Uh, there were people that were able to figure out what was going on. Fred Bach told me he was one of them. But because uh, he recognized the names of some of the scientists that were in Project Alberta, which was basically a unit that was attached to the 509th. It was 54 scientists who finally assembled the bomb on Tinian. And so Fred Bach recognized some of their names, but they didn't dare talk about it. Because if they talked about it, they had the potential of being sent out of the unit. They were told initially. When, when they were formed at Wendover, Paul right away stood up on a truck and he told the guys, you know, that you're going to be on a mission that's going to win the war, and we just, you can't talk about it. What you see here, let us stay here, that sort of thing. And they were immediately given two weeks furlough, and some of the men were followed home and were checked on, and some of them that did open their mouths and talk, they got a real talking to from Tibbets when they came back to base. Wow. <laughs> Um, so can you talk about your, um, the, the, some of the 509th veterans that you knew? So you mentioned that you were good friends with Fred Bach and a few sure. others. Sure. Well, I've, I've, over the years, we probably met at least 300 of the veterans over, over all the reunions. And I became very close to some of the fellows. One of them, two of them I became close to. The first one was Ray Gallagher. And there's interviews of Ray out there, which you can watch. He's, I believe there's, uh, there's a tape on your website of, of Ray talking. And Ray is what I would call the common man. He was not highly educated. But Ray gave me the perspective in the beginning. I, you know, he just, he told me exactly. He said war, he, and he calls it in his, his video at the Greenwich Workshop, he calls war as a monster and it had to be stopped. And uh, basically Ray told me, he said, to fully understand this, if you're going to argue Monday morning quarterback the atomic bomb, you have to understand, you have to live those times. And that's what Ray did. I mean, and again in this video, he'll talk about, he's sitting around and 
table with his family, and he's talking about how this brother was in the Navy, and this brother might have been in the Army, and how they would uh, walk down the street and see the flags in the window of the deceased, uh, the Red Star and the Blue Star. Blue Star meaning, Red, Red Star, I think it was, they were in the service, and I think Blue Star, no, Gold Star was deceased. That's right. And basically that's, I mean, Ray really put it in perspective for me. And he was just quite a nice guy. Uh, we corresponded and, and saw each other at the reunions. Ray was given disposition, dispensation by Paul Tibbetts to be in the 393rd or to, he's another one of the Eglin Field fellows. Ray wore eyeglasses. And so Ray's vision, you know, to, you weren't supposed to be in the Army Air Force with glasses. But Ray wore glasses, and all the pictures you see of him, except for in her book, we, we did have a picture of him with the glasses on. You won't see him wearing the glasses. But towards the end of his life, uh, one day I called home. I was talking to my wife, and she said, you just got a package in the mail. I said, really? What is it? And she said, it's from Ray Gallagher, and it's a pair of glasses. So. <clears throat> Anyway, he sent the glasses that he wore on the mission, so, which are very special to me. The other one that's special to me is, is Don Albury. Uh, we did books, well, we did book signings with Ray Gallagher, but we also did book se sessions with uh, Don Albury. And Don was just really a great fellow. He was very loyal to Charles Sweeney. Uh, I know there were comments over the years that there were other people that might have done a better job on that second mission than what they did. But uh, Don was always very defensive of what they did and that it was successful. And one night we were at, we were at a book signing and one night we were at dinner and we're sitting there casually talking and, and Don says to me, he says, you know, Bob, I still have my flight suit. I said, really? He says, yeah. He said, I said, where is it? He said, it's hanging in my garage. He says, do you want it? I said, well, sure. I said, I'll be proud owner of it. I take really good care of it. So he gave me the flight suit and the hat that he wore on both missions now. And so we framed it. And when we do book signing events or shows, uh, we take that flight suit along. We were also, uh, now that was given me, uh, sort of a long story, but we ended up purchasing the flight suit that Paul Tibbetts wore on the first mission. In fact, as near as we can tell, uh, the Distinguished Service Cross is still in the same position that General Spatz put on the uniform when Paul got off the plane. I think what probably happened was that Paul just rolled up that uniform and put it in his footlocker, and it stayed there up until the 1970s when it was donated to a traveling museum. The owner of the museum died and the widow eventually put the flight suit up for sale, and I was fortunate enough to be able to buy it. And with it, uh, I've been able to put together a binder of provenance on that flight suit, so we do know it flew the mission. In fact, we actually had pictures of Paul wearing that suit in his office at Executive Jet Aviation. And we've taken that with the Albury flight suit, and we display it. Uh, Don also thought a lot of me. He had a brother who was killed in over France. He was in a B-25. He was on a mission, and it's a, it's a famous picture. You can, you can look it up. Uh, of His plane was shot in the engine area, and you can see the plane going down, and the engine is just spinning off on its own. And Don thought enough of me to give me uh, his brother's Purple Heart and his air medal. So we also have that in our possession, and we take that to shows to, uh, as well. And we've been to his brother's gravesite. The uh, when the war was over, they recovered the the remains of the uh, the crew, and they are buried in uh, the Zachary Taylor Cemetery in Louisville, Kentucky. And we visit there from time to time. Very sad sight. The area that which that that he's buried in. Uh, there's many flight crews, and it's really sad to walk in this area and see just his five, six, seven, eight names all in a common grave. But Don was another one, and you'll see that in a 
in a tape interview by him where he said it was, you know, the war, they just wanted to stop the fighting. They wanted to stop the killing. And they were very happy that the atomic bomb did that. And I've heard that from Japanese people as well. Who else in the Bible and I did you get to know at these reunions? You mentioned Paul a few times. Well, we got to know Fred O'Levy pretty good. Uh, we started doing our book signing events with Fred O'Levy. What we did was I, I managed over the, over the years, we, when I first started collecting, we, we did all our photos in black and white. And in 1994 at the Chicago reunion that Fred chaired, uh, the Smithsonian came forward and they asked if anybody had any color slides. They wanted to borrow them. So I kind of watched to see who raised their hands with the color slides. And the men who had the color slides, eventually they, they actually ended up giving me the slides. So what I did with Fred, by now going to the photo lab and having these negatives made and the copies made, this is getting expensive. It's a lot of money out of my pocket. So I talked to Fred, I said, at the 94 reunion, I said, Fred, would you like to do some signing events with us? And what I did was I cooked up a, a deal where I would pay him to sign the pictures and I would sell the pictures. And that's basically what became the foundation of my cash flow, how I was able to build this collection. And, you know, I would listen to, in all the, in all the years we did this, I've never had except for one occasion, somebody actually come up and say, how could you do this? And it was, I remember we were at a, at a gun show and Fred was there and this young girl came up and I noticed she stood in the background and listened to Fred talk for a long time. And then she came up and she said that, you know, how could you kill all these people? And Fred was very good. He was very, you know, he justified the use of the bomb and he, he was able to make her understand by living those times and why they did it. But Fred would, uh, you know, I'd hear a lot of stories from Fred. Fred was a, a very happy-go-lucky Italian gentleman who uh, just, he knew a lot of the people in the 509th and he introduced me to a lot of them. So, those are the people that really stand out to me. You know, again, I, I knew so many of them. I knew Chuck Sweeney, a very you know, happy Irishman. Uh, you mentioned you did a lot of signings with Dutch Van Kirk. Did you get to know him well? Oh, yes. I forgot about that. Yeah, Dutch was almost like a second father to me. We did 14 years of book signings with Dutch, and we had a lot of fun with him. Uh, he was very happy-go-lucky. He was also an excellent spokesperson on the bomb. Uh, and, and it got to be in later years, when he would be up doing a talk, he'd forget a name. <laughs> And he'd say, Bob, who was that? And I'd say, oh, that was Bob Furman, or, you know, that was whoever. And did you know General Tibbetts well at all? Yes, I knew General Tibbetts. And I kind of say that because I actually got chewed out by General Tibbetts. So I know what it was like to get chewed out by him. Uh, when we first did our book, it was a paperback book. and. Paul had been to, I think it was the Wichita reunion, which was the year before we went hardcover in our book. And he really liked the book. So he said, I'd like a case. He said, will you send me a case? Well, I got a problem now because I basically have sold out of these paperbacks and I'm transitioning into hardcover. And this is not something that I can do right away. This is gonna take six to nine months. So, we go to this show in Louisville, Kentucky, and I, I'm in line, I'm going to have Paul sign something for me, and I'm paying to have him sign it. And he looked at me and he just gave me, holy heck, because here, you know, where's my books? Oh, he just let me have it. I didn't think he was, I thought I was done right then and there. Uh, he eventually got over it. But I think what helped me was he liked my wife, Amelia. He always gave her a big smile and gave her a big hug, so, yeah, I knew him. So did he come to many of the 509th reunions? Uh, I think he did before we, we did the reunions. Uh, in our 17 reunions that we did, 
uh, he came, as I remember, to only one of them, which was the Wichita reunion. Did, so did he stay in touch with members of the 509th closely as well then? He himself personally? Mm -hmm. uh, I can't answer that. I, I think he stayed in touch with uh, Dutch Van Kirk and Tom Ferriby and probably Dick Nelson. Uh, because they were doing book signing events together. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as other people are concerned, I, I don't think so. Okay. The, the people that Paul met at Eglin Field were not combat trained. And so there were people in the 509th, such as Tom Klassen, of course Paul Tibbetts, Tom and, and uh, Dutch, they had all been on combat missions, but there were other people like Jim Price and um, J James Hopkins, these, are, these fellows had all flown missions. And their ego was such that some of them felt that they could have done a better job on the second mission, the Nagasaki mission. Uh, but again, there were difficulties on that mission. They took off in a storm. Uh, there was lightning. There was some indecision for a period of time as to whether they should take off. There were 660 gallons of trapped gas. It was a spare tank inside the plane. And they weren't sure that they were able to access that fuel tank. And it, later on, I knew Fred Clayton, who was the crew chief on that plane. The day after the Nagasaki mission, Fred Clayton and the Fred Bach crew did take that plane up in the air to see if the, the fuel transfer pump would work, and it did. But John Kuharik, who was on the Sweeney Albury crew, had a difficult time getting fuel from that tank. And the way I look at that is, I, I want to use the term idiocentric if that's correct. Uh, for example, I might have a car that I know how to start, but you may not know how to do that. Well, uh, the fellow who was the flight engineer in boxcar, Rod, Rod Arnold, knew how to work that tank, but John Kuharik might not have. And then the other problem they had on that mission was the fact that the uh, photo plane had not shown up. And uh, they, they lost time circling around at the initial point, waiting for that plane to show up. And then the decision was finally made to, to go on. I think they were 45 minutes at the initial point. So they were, they were using up precious fuel at that point. And uh, eventually, uh, they, they'd used up so much, well, they went to Kokura, and they, Los Alamos mandated that the bomb be dropped visually. They could not see the target because Kokura, or a city nearby, had been uh, targeted, and there was smoke and clouds over the city, so Behan could not see it. So then the decision was made to go on to Nagasaki, and after making three runs over Nagasaki, I believe on the third run, uh, Kermit Behan claimed he could see it, and so they dropped the bomb. The decision to go on to Nagasaki was made by the Navy commander on board, Fred Ashworth. So this did not sit well with Paul Tibbetts, and so it was, that's why there's been commentary afterwards that there may have been people, or people within the 509 thought they could have done a better job. My feeling on that was they accomplished what they were supposed to do, and the war ended. You know, they did that on August 9th. On the 14th of August, Japanese sued to surrender, sued for peace. I've heard different stories about why the photo plane failed to meet at the rendezvous. Do you know what the the accepted story. Well, is. it was it was piloted by James Hopkins, and as as the story goes, uh, they were on they were getting ready to take off, and the scientist on board who was to operate the fast tax camera was Bob Serber. He was a member of uh, Project Alberta, and his camera was a, a camera that could shoot many pictures per second. So Serber did not have his parachute. So uh, Hopkins told him to go back and get his parachute, but in the meantime, he took off. And so here was Serber on the ground, and they're up in the air, and nobody knew how to operate that camera. It is thought uh, 
in my talking with Dick Cannon, who was the radar operator, and Stan Steinke, who was the navigator on that ship, that they were at an altitude above. So, but they, you know, they did not, they finally met up with the other planes after the bomb had been dropped. So they all met in Okinawa when the planes landed. Of course, the boxcar, when it landed, uh, two engines were out of fuel. So, if not three, or all. Thanks for that explanation. Um, so if you'd like to discuss your book, The 509th Remembered, and a Certainly. little bit about how you came to write it. And then if you want it, you can hold it up. Okay, well, this is, this is our book, The 509th Remembered. Uh, it's also the same name as our website, which thankfully you have linked on your site. Uh, if you remember, we, we talked about how my wife and I did a book in 2001 about the stories at, uh, from the men at Wendover. And so each year that we did a reunion, we added to that book. So every year the men were getting a souvenir book. Finally in 2005, we felt we had enough stories to finally go hardcover, and that's when we put this book together. Uh, we since have added uh, more sections to the book. We're planning on doing another one for the 75th anniversary, but that's, that's gonna be a while down, down the road. Um, and it sounds like your wife shares your passion for this history. My whole family does. Uh, my son goes to shows with us. He helps set up the displays. He's very much aware of our displays. Uh, my wife typed every word in the book. Basically, uh, what she did was she edited, she edited all the stories, and then she typed them all. And basically, I just all I did was arrange the stories chronologically and inserted the pictures. But it's been a it's a family project. So, what is it like to visit Wendover today for those who haven't been? What can tourists see, and how have the site's been preserved? Well, that would be a good question to ask James Peterson, who's the president of Historic Wendover Airfield. But it's it's really a it's really a neat experience because it's the, to my knowledge, the only existing World War II airfield that's left. And Jim has done a remarkable job on rebuilding the hangar uh, called the Enola Gay Hangar. Uh, he's just rebuilt the officers' club. And you can see the, the original barracks that the men were staying in are still there. So it's, it's, very, it's, it's very worthwhile seeing it. And the isolation really is very stark. You can see why they chose Wendover. Uh, several of the guys, uh, Locke Easton comes to mind. He was a pilot on... Uh, uh, next objective it was, or what was later called next objective. And he told me that he sat one night listening to telephone calls going out of the base. So all the lines were tapped going in and out. And it was, uh, most of it was done by the 1395th MPs, which that was the MP military police unit of the 509th. And um, the Enola Gay is not very far from here in Chantilly, Virginia. Can, can right. you talk about that? Well, we were uh, we had a reunion here. I believe it was in 2005. They uh, that was about a, not quite a year after the plane was put on display, and they opened up the bomb bay door for us, and so we were able to the veterans were able to ride up on a scissor lift and look inside the plane. Uh, they did a wonderful job on restoring it. Uh, I would imagine if they wanted to, they could probably fly it. It's that, that kind of condition. It's 100% complete. I was told there was 10,000 hours put in on polishing that plane. I think when you see a B-29 like that, uh, all of a sudden you realize how, how big it is. Uh, you know, you don't think of it that way until you actually see it. Yes, I was incredibly impressed by how big it was when I saw it. Have you seen Boxcar at, at the Wright-Patterson Museum? We've been there several times. Uh, yes, I've seen it. Uh, they, it still belongs to the Air Force. It's still on the Air Force uh, records. Uh, they've done a, a nice job. They, they redid it, it like the Enola Gay sat outside for some time. And matter of fact, 
uh, when it arrived at Wright Patterson, they actually had, they thought it was the great artiste. And they actually had the great artiste painted on it. But they, uh, they recreated the nose art. It's fairly accurate and it looks very good. It's, it's a great museum. I recommend going to the Smithsonian. I recommend going to Wright Patterson. Do any of the other B-29 silver plates survive today or are those the only two left? Those uh, of the 15 that were built for the 509th composite group, those are the, the only two that survived. And that's quite a statement for the unit that you know two of their planes are still out there. Definitely. Have you ever flown in a B-29? No, I have not. Have you seen Fifi fly? I have. I've also seen Doc fly. I was also instrumental in negotiating a ride for Naris Jernigan this past summer to fly inside Doc. Hopefully next year I can do it. That's great. I'll have to ask Norris about that. <laughs> uh, so how would you describe the legacy of the Manhattan Project, or more specifically the 509th Composite Group today? What would you like people to know and remember about the men inv involved? It's my belief, it's, and I'm going to go back to what Ray Gallagher said to me again, that, you know, it's that the war had to be stopped, and they did the right thing. Uh, they had to stop the killing. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind there would have been an invasion of Japan. The Japanese would not stop. It was a different culture back then. That's, that's why Ray kept saying to me, you had to put yourself back in those times. The Japanese people today are different from what they were back then. They had the culture of Bushido, which was a warrior culture. And again, they just wouldn't stop their fighting. Uh, they were training women and children to fight hand-to-hand -hand combat, combat. And our troops would have landed and there would have been more killing, both Japanese and Americans. So the legacy is that they did stop the war, they did stop the killing, and we've had many years of peace since then. What are your thoughts on the Manhattan Project National Historical Park, which was established in 2015 with units at Los Alamos, Hanford, and Oak Ridge? How, how would you like to see this history presented? I think you guys are doing a fantastic job. I, I'm not going to tell you what to do because I think you're doing the right thing. I'm glad to see that you're working really hard to preserve it. You've got a wonderful website doing a great job. That's all I can Thank say. You. <laughs> Thank you. Did you know Mor uh, Morris Jepson? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew Morris Jepson. Morris, Morris I, I have letters. Well, I, nobody really knew where Morris Jepson was until the 1995 reunion at Albuquerque. And all of a sudden, out of a clear blue sky, here's Morris Jepson. In fact, at that time, I believe Morris even thought that some of the stuff was still secret. But uh, we, we became fast friends, and uh, we corresponded back and forth quite a bit. Now, at one point, Morris was asking me for assistance on selling those Hiroshima plugs. And at one point, Morris did put them on eBay. And if you were alert to the fact that they were on eBay, he had them for sale for $50,000, which would have been quite a buy at that time had you bought them. Because we now know they sold for 165000 at auction. But uh, yeah, Nar Morris was you know, very good. And the- Very intelligent. And the sale of those plugs was br what brought Clay Perkins into the fold of Correct. Interest in the 509. I, I, Clay sent me, I can't remember if it was Clay or if it was Morris, that sent me a picture of Clay in their kitchen, Morris's kitchen area, with a wood-burning set. And they're burning the initials of Morris Jepson into the plugs. And when I saw that, I said, my God, they're, they're wrecking a, a historic item. So the next reunion, I think, it was, I've, I think it was a reunion we had in New Orleans, I'm talking to Clay. Clay said he wanted to bring the plugs and, and show them to us and put them in a case, which I, I brought the display case and we showed them. So we're standing there talking and Clay's got the plugs in one hand and then he puts 
his hand in the pocket, and he brings out another plug. So he had an exact replica. And so then I finally understood why he had it, the initials burned into the original set of plugs, because that shows that those are the original plugs, because it, it was so easy to make a replica of it. So, so the original ones have his initials in it? That's correct. A little bit of trivia there. Hmm. I think if there are any other veterans that you mentioned. I know, I know you mentioned George Karen earlier. Um, was he somebody you got to know well? I did. We, we visited him at his house uh, when we went to the reunion in 1990. I think it was 90 or 90. I'm not clear which one it was. But he didn't go to one of them. And we stopped at his house on the way. And so we, I had corresponded with George. And also, I, we had been to his house. I have a nice picture that I treasure of our young son shaking hands with George. 